Einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer Reihe Lecture in Film unter dem Titel Easier Than Painting, die Filme von Andy Warhol. Ja, wir haben gerade Sommerpause gehabt, obwohl es erst Frühjahr war, kann man so sagen. Das zweite Semester dieser Reihe beginnt und wir freuen uns auch dieses Mal wieder ganz wunderbare Referenten gewonnen zu haben, was natürlich dank der wunderbaren Kooperation erst möglich geworden ist mit der Goethe-Universität. Drei der vier Organisatoren sind auch heute hier. Einer davon ist der Referent des heutigen Tages. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass das auch dieses Mal wieder so wunderbar geklappt hat. Also einfach auf den Plan achten, jeden zweiten Donnerstag im ist eine solche Veranstaltung und Lecture und Film für alle, die zum ersten Mal da sind, bedeutet bei uns, es gibt einen circa 50-minütigen Vortrag, dann gibt es eine kurze Pause, dann kommt der Film. Der Film stammt wirklich tatsächlich aus dem Museum of Modern Arts, ist auf 16 mm, auf dem Material, das Warhol auch benutzt hat und wir können das ja auch abspielen. Deswegen wundern Sie sich auch nachher nicht, es gibt eine kleine Pause beim Rollenwechsel, ähm, weil das Material nicht gekoppelt werden darf. Und da bleibt es dann kurz schwarz, also nicht irritiert sein, dann geht es weiter. Und ja, danach, nach diesem Film gibt es dann eine Diskussion, wie immer, da haben Sie die Möglichkeit, Fragen zu stellen, Kommentare abzugeben. Der Referent wird dann auch vorne sein und den sind heute und da freuen wir uns sehr darauf. Ähm, dazu kommt, dass wir natürlich ein Begleitprogramm wie immer machen. Ähm, jeden Mittwoch und Samstag um 18 Uhr haben wir Filme für Sie ausgewählt, die sich dem Pop Begriff des Popkino, den es so eigentlich bisher vielleicht noch gar nicht gab, widmen sollen. Und in diesem Monat ähm, sind das alles Filme über Stars. Stars, die Warhol porträtiert hat. Ähm, ich mag schon mal, ich sag schon mal die drei, die schon rum sind. Das war Muhammad Ali mit When We Were Kings. Dann Elizabeth Taylor mit Cleopatra und Grace Jones mit Wamp. Aber was noch bevorsteht, und das sollte man nicht verpassen, ähm, ein wirkliches Highlight, was selten auf der Leinwand zu sehen ist, Moonwalker mit Michael Jackson in der Hauptrolle gibt es am Samstag oder Mittwoch um 18 Uhr nochmal zu sehen. Ja, genug der Vorworte an dieser Stelle. Ähm, es kommt noch ein organisatorisches Wort von Regine Prange, ehe dann Vincent Hediger den Referenten des heutigen Abends vorstellt. Ich wünsche Ihnen einen wunderbaren Abend. Viel Spaß. Ja, ich darf Sie herzlich begrüßen, freue mich sehr, dass es weitergeht und darüber, dass auch jede Menge bekannte Gesichter aus der Kunstgeschichte hier präsent sind. Und in diesem Rahmen möchte ich noch mal ein paar formelle Anmerkungen machen, denn es handelt sich ja hier um eine Lehrveranstaltung, die begleitend zu Seminarveranstaltungen läuft und die auch als Vorlesung besucht werden kann. Also wenn Sie die Vorlesung besuchen hier, wäre es ganz gut, wenn Sie dann Ihre Kinotickets sammeln und dann sozusagen am Schluss vorlegen können und den Besuch der Vorlesung sozusagen nachweisen können. Für die Masterstudierenden, also solche unter Ihnen, die den Master Kunstgeschichte äh, studieren, äh, ist es ja so, dass Sie die Vorlesung auch mit einem Na Leistungsnachweis äh, sozusagen absolvieren müssen, also eine kleine Prüfung äh, absolvieren. Und äh, dazu würde ich eben die äh, unter Ihnen bitten, mit mir Regine Prang ist mein Name, Kontakt aufzunehmen, am besten per E-Mail, weil ich nämlich in diesem Semester äh, Forschungssemester wahrnehme und nicht äh, am Institut so häufig bin. Also nehmen Sie einfach Kontakt zu mir auf, dann werden wir ein solches Prüfungsgespräch zu einem Film oder einem Text Ihrer Wahl oder einem Vortrag Ihrer Wahl dann verabreden und äh, durchführen. Ähm, also das ist das Prozedere für dieses Semester. Auch die unter Ihnen jetzt kommt Henning Engelke gerade, der die äh, teilnehmen an dem Seminar, das er durchführt. <lacht> Den ist sozusagen auch ähm, sei gesagt, dass Sie doch bitte die, die Tickets sammeln und das sozusagen als Nachweis äh, verwenden. Ich glaube, das war schon alles. Dann gebe ich jetzt das Wort an Vincent Hediger, der den heutigen Referenten vorstellen wird. Viel Spaß. Ja, guten Abend und äh, herzlich willkommen. Äh, wenn man Mark Siegel vorstellen soll, dann beginnen die Schwierigkeiten damit, dass zu seinen vielen Talenten gehört, dass er einer der besten Vorsteller und Moderatoren ist, die ich kenne. Ähm, also gemessen an dem, was Mark jetzt in dieser Situation zu leisten in der Lage wäre, ist das, was jetzt kommt, äh, ein dilettantischer Versuch. Ähm, 
Mark Siegel vorzustellen hier in Frankfurt, könnte man jetzt sagen, er rübrigt sich schon fast. He needs no introduction to the point where we could say, did you notice his new glasses? <lacht> um, ich werde es aber trotzdem versuchen, in diejenigen, die Mark Siegel nicht so gut kennen, dass sie schon wissen, dass die neue Brille wirklich eine sehr tolle Brille ist, um, dass die auch mitkriegen, wer das ist. Mark Siegel ist, wie gesagt, ein Mensch von vielfältigen Talenten. Er ist äh, technisch gesehen wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter am Lehrstuhl für Filmwissenschaft der Goethe-Universität Frankfurt. Er war zuvor wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter in einem Forschungsprojekt ähm, im Sonderforschungsbereich äh, der FU Berlin über die ähm, äh, wie heißt das nochmal? Ästhetik, was war das? Ah, Kulturen des Performativen, das war der andere SFB. Ja. Kulturen des, äh, des Performativen, wo er als äh, wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter gearbeitet hat. Ähm, er äh, blickt auf eine langjährige, vielfältige internationale Lehrtätigkeit zurück, in der Schweiz, in den USA, in Deutschland äh, und äh, anderswo. hat länger auch an der FU in Berlin ähm, unterrichtet, äh, seinen, seine Doktorarbeit hat er äh, absolviert, geschrieben äh, an der UCLA, der University of California in Los Angeles. Ähm, aus dieser Doktorarbeit entsteht gerade ein Buch, beziehungsweise das Manuskript ist fertig und es wird wohl äh, im nächsten Jahr publiziert werden unter dem Titel The Gossip of Images. Ähm, ein Buch, von dem ich Ihnen jetzt schon sagen kann, dass es einen sehr wichtigen Beitrag zum äh, rasch sich entwickelnden Feld der Queer Theory leisten wird und auch einen Beitrag zu unserer Kenntnis der Experimentalfilm- und Underground-Szene, vor allem in den USA in den 60er und 70er Jahren. Ähm, Im persönlichen Register könnte ich die Vorstellung so weiterführen, und das will ich jetzt auch tun, vor 15 Jahren, äh, vor 14 Jahren, bin ich zum ersten Mal an die Jahrestagung der Society for Cinema Studies äh, nach Chicago gereist, der amerikanischen Fachgesellschaft. Und ich betrachte das nach wie vor als meine erfolgreichste Kongressreise ähm, überhaupt je, unter anderem deswegen, weil ich da Mark Siegel kennengelernt habe, mit dem ich äh, seither in vielfältigen Zusammenhängen immer zusammengearbeitet habe. Und äh, ich erachte es als ein besonderes Privileg, dass er seit drei Jahren mit uns hier in Frankfurt tätig ist und seine vielfältigen Kenntnisse und Fähigkeiten, die ja über den Film und die Filmwissenschaft weit hinausgehen, das Theater betreffen. Mark ist auch ein sehr produktiver Kurator. Er ist im, sowohl in der Wissenschaft als auch als Kurator einer der besten Kenner des Werks von Jack Smith und überhaupt des amerikanischen Underground Films. Es ist eine großartige Angelegenheit, dass er in Frankfurt ist und mit uns arbeitet. Und ich freue mich sehr, ihn heute Abend über jemanden zu sprechen, sprechen zu hören, äh, der äh, im Werk von Warhol eine wichtige Rolle gespielt hat, bei Jack Smith eine wichtige Rolle gespielt hat und der kurz vor seinem leider zu frühen Tod, vor mittlerweile einem Jahr, ähm, noch ein Comeback erlebt hat, plötzlich wieder öffentlich wahrnehmbar war, nämlich Mario Montes. Ähm, der Darsteller des Films, den wir heute Abend sehen werden. Und äh, dieses Comeback verdankt er auch Mark Siegel, der ihn nämlich aufgesucht und gefunden hat und ihn zurückgebracht hat ins Rampenlicht, wo er hingehört. Mark Siegel. Thank you. Um, thank you. Ich, ich werde heute Abend auf Englisch reden. Um, aber ich kann dann gerne uh, danach auf Deutsch diskutieren. Um, first, thank you very much, Vincent, for that introduction um, with many unnecessary private details. Um, and I thank also my other colleagues, Henning Engelke and Regina Pranga, for this um, wonderful collaboration on this Warhol series. I'm very happy that we're entering our second semester. 
Um, and of course, special thanks to Urs Buri for his extremely reliable and engaged um, support of the series and his work on ensuring that every single evening comes off perfectly. Um, of course, he does that with the help of his colleagues here in the Film Museum, the projectionists, and um, the other staff here. Thank you. Um, I, I've, I'm not happy with um, the title yet, but I've, the title I've changed to The Idea of Harlow, The Idea of Mario Montez. And I begin with a quote. Loathing for Warhol, as it was doubtless meant to, comes by now, for some time has come, naturally. With this awkwardly dramatic sentence, James Stoller, one of the most astute critics, oh, oops, did I go the wrong direction? Nope, there we go. With this awkwardly dramatic sentence, James Stoller, one of the most astute critics of Warhol's cinema throughout the 1960s, opened a 1968 essay that addressed and attempted to redress the increasing widespread frustration over the artist's provocative films and public persona. Stoller refers to Warhol's outrageous waste of film and money in the context of an overwhelmingly poor underground film scene and his seeming lack of moral and political concern as evidenced by his interest in getting Edie Sedgwick onto the fashion pages while everyone else, he says, was focused on American involvement in Vietnam. In terms of the films, he singles out their length, they all run too long, he says, uneventfulness, rudimentary technique, and most significantly, their frequent depiction of vulnerable, fragile personalities in humiliating situations, seemingly beyond their control. It is this final point that receives the most consideration in Stoller's essay, because he sees in these complex and often troubling cinematic depictions of unpleasantly exposed performers one of the true innovations of Warhol's filmmaking. For Stoller, the on-screen degradation suffered by some of the factory superstars, think for instance of Edie Sedgwick in Beauty No. 2 and Poor Little Rich Girl, oops, or the performer's visible discomfort with the demeaning contrivances of the dramatic situation. Think of Mario Montez in Screen Test No. 2 and the Chelsea Girls, or Marie Mencken in The Life of Juanita Castro. Such moments, he argues, may test an audience's patience and compassion, but in doing so, they can also prod viewers into attending to the conditions of the film's own production. Quote, the carefully created ambiance provoking conditions, which make it impossible for us to take the things as films alone. They presume to engage us in other ways." End quote. Stoller's essay, by the way, is titled Beyond Cinema. For Stoller, Warhol's films become uniquely interesting when viewers bring outside information about, for example, the lives, work, and sexual practices of the performers to bear on their reception of these sometimes disturbing on-screen images. He concludes his article with the following claim. The places where Warhol's art speaks in its own voice, which is consequently a voice worth listening to, are the places where film and gossip, which for so long have bolstered and helped sustain each other in secret, mingle openly and for the first time without shame. Film and gossip have been integrally related since at least the development of the star system in the 1910s, when producers began intentionally circulating rumors in the press about their screen performers so as to generate interest for their upcoming films. At this time, stars like Florence Lawrence and Mary Pickford first started getting their names into the film credits and onto the theater marquees. As the star system developed, gossip and rumors about stars proliferated, 
and in their lurid attention to emotional, sexual, and social transgressions, often stood in contrast to the upright moral world presented in the on-screen images. Kenneth Anger's Hollywood Babylon books, which tell Hollywood history as the scandalous story of a disparity between on-screen wholesomeness and off-screen social and sexual deviance, represent one example of film and gossip mingling openly without shame. For Stoller, Warhol's film seemed to offer another one, except that in Warhol's case, the gossip is not about the Hollywood stars, who sometimes are the ostensible subjects of his films, Jean Harlow, Hedy Lamarr, or Lana Turner, for instance, but about his own factory superstars. And you see here, of course, um, Mario Montez, um, yeah, as Lana Turner. You see that Mario Montez performed Lana Turner and Hedy Lamarr with the same wig. <laughs> Um, and then you see a strip of images um, of shots taken of Mara Montez um, in a different wig as Harlow in Harlot. Although Stoller does not mention Warhol's first sound film, Harlot, from 1964, as one of the difficult films he finds interesting, I would like to suggest that it functions not only as a prime example of Warhol's art speaking in its own voice, but also as a model for a great number of the artists' other efforts in sound film. In order to make this claim, I will need to tell you a bit about Harlot and the ambiance provoking conditions of its production. And in so doing, I hope also to tell you a bit more about the commingling of film and gossip. Um, I should apologize in advance for on the one hand, the wrong aspect ratio of these shots. Of course, we're used to the fact that they're 16 millimeter um, films in 4.3, and I just filmed these from a iPhone, like unofficially from the screen. So the, so the film is much brighter than, than these and narrower. Like many of Warhol's mid-period films, Harlot consists of two 33-minute, unedited, black-and-white, 16-millimeter rolls. The film was shot on the Oricon camera, which recorded sync sound directly onto the film. And interestingly, uh, the film is known as Warhol's first sound film, but I believe it is also perhaps the first sync sound film in the underground itself. The camera angle changes ever so slightly between the reels, but the film features none of the zooms, pans, and tilts that entered Warhol's later film vocabulary. Other than the addition of a soundtrack, the film exhibits many of the characteristics commonly associated with the artist's early minimalist silent films like Blowjob, Empire, and Henry Geltzahler. Namely, a single shot captured by a static camera on a tripod and subject to no post-production editing. After about a year and a half of producing silent films, Warhol, who had already used an Oricon sound camera to film the silent Empire and Henry Geltzahler in July of 1964, decided in November of that year that he would move into talkies and that he needed someone who could supply sounds, as he put it. As the story goes, poet and Warhol's assistant Gerard Malanga took the artist to the Le Metro Coffee House, a staple of the downtown poetry scene, to hear Ronald Tavell reading from his then unpublished novel, Street of Stairs, a novel which um, I would recommend is also published now um, in two different, zwei verschiedene Übersetzungen auf Deutsch. Um, for kurzem, for zwei Jahren, kann man um, Straßen der Stufen von Ronald Tevel kaufen, Männerschwärm Verlag. Warhol was apparently impressed by both the sheer amount of Tevel's written work and by the quality of the writer's voice. So he invited him to read on the soundtrack of his upcoming film, either from his novel, poetry, or, as Tevel recalled, maybe even the telephone directory. So it was obvious that Warhol was simply interested in sounds. 
When Tavel arrived at the factory on East 47th Street on December 13th for the shooting of Harlot, he was surprised to find out that Warhol had a new idea for the soundtrack and had asked him instead to carry on an improvised conversation with British poet Harry Fainlight and photographer and lighting designer Billy Linich, otherwise known as, as Billy Name, neither of whom Tavel knew well. For Tavel, this change of plan was one of Warhol's, quote, typical last minute turnabouts intended to dismantle a performance possibly prepared in advance, along with the fictions of a rehearsed performance. Harlot features the underground drag queen superstar Mario Montez in a platinum wig, which Tavel described as resembling an ill-skinned white cat, and a white pleated seal chapman chiffon gown reclining on the factory couch next to the full-figured Karol Kaczynski in a black spaghetti strap dress on his left. Just by the way, I would point out that Montez wears the same dress and wig which Jack Smith gave him in Mario Banana 1 and 2, which were both likely shot on the same day as Harlot, as well as in his brief appearance in Warhol's earlier collaboration with Smith, Batman Dracula, which was Mario Montez's first appearance with Smith. And you can see Mario here um, and Jack Smith over here and a bunch of other people. <laughs> um, on her lap, Kaczynski holds a white fluffy Angora cat played by Montez's own cat, Snowball, credited here as White Pussy. Gerard Malanga in a black suit and Philip Fagan in a black t-shirt are perched behind the couch Malanga behind, behind Montez and Fagan behind Kaczynski. The couch itself is at a slight diagonal to the camera, angled from the bottom left of the frame towards the top right, so that the performers almost appear to occupy two parallel diagonal planes of action and focus. Malanga Montez in the front, Fagan Kaczynski white pussy in the back. Fagan's right arm is bent, and rests on top of the couch while his left arm is propped against the sofa so that he can rest his head in his left hand. With little interruption, both he and Kaczynski maintain an intense stare into the camera for almost the entirety of the film. Whereas Malanga in the front plane of the image primarily looks down onto Montez. You will see as the film begins, uh, Malanga is looking towards the camera for reasons um, uh, maybe we'll make clear in a second but um, very quickly he moves into um, the position we, we see here. White Pussy, not surprisingly, fails to maintain focus throughout the almost 70 minute tableau vivant and frequently reacts to noises in the factory, looking off camera somewhat in alignment with Malanga's stare. I don't have an image of that exactly, but at one point, White Pussy attempts to break free but Kaczynski manages to restrain her with a tight grip. A bright white light, and here we see, um, here she's back in position somewhat. A bright white light illuminates the tableau from above and off screen right and highlights the whiteness of Montez's dress and wig, Kaczynski's flesh and white pussy's fur, while relegating Fagan and Malanga to a kind of shadowy existence behind them. None of the performers speak. The dark seductiveness of Fagin's casual stare and the soft vulnerability of Kaczynski's studied attentiveness are sufficient to solicit our interest in watching this carefully, indeed magnificently composed portrait. For Tavel, Kuch quote, Kaczynski's real contribution to Harlot are the subtle, the thousand subtle, nearly escapable ex expressions that emanate from her still face. It is altogether possible to view the film by concentrating on her face alone and to come away thus viewing with most of the flick under one's eye. That said, I still wouldn't recommend that strategy for your first viewing of the film. Look, look at Mario. Most of what can rightly be called screen action entails the execution of simple tasks predominantly, but not exclusively, performed by Montez. Namely, 
the slow peeling, fillating, and eating of bananas, discovered in various places, from his handbag to behind Kaczynski's back to beneath the couch's cushions. But there are other tasks as well. Malanga lights and smokes cigarettes and blows the smoke in Montez's face. Montez kisses Malanga. Malanga passes cigarettes to Fagan, who lets them fall to the ground. Kaczynski drinks from a can of beer. Fagan pours a cup of water on Kaczynski, who responds by pouring her can of beer on his head, etc. Kaczynski, Malanga, and Fagan fulfill these tasks as if following instructions. They don't seem to do so out of any concern with creating a believable character or contributing to the dramatics of an unusual situation. More on this in a second. The story of the film, if we can speak of one, is supplied by Montez, who performs with obvious relish the role of a glamorous, if somewhat risque, diva, with no other cares in the world than to seductively eat one banana after the other. The static indifference of the other performers throws Montez's dynamic performance into relief. Although the focused but somewhat blasé situation might not seem to warrant it, Montez is nevertheless forging a role, a character, that of a beguiling and frivolous woman confident of her erotic powers. We sense his commitment to this character when he luxuriates in the discovery of yet another banana, or when he taunts Kaczynski with a banana that is reserved only for him, or when he toys with an at first unresponsive malanga, or when he simply holds a banana in his white evening gloved hands, contemplates it, flirts with it, and sizes it up with his eyes. Montez is always on, always performing for the camera. Filmmaker and performer in Warhol, Marie Mencken noted, Warhol's most impressive star, Mario Montez, is a man. He, she played harlot in a blonde wig, and there were moments in that film that should ensure Andy's reputation as a remarkable artist, even if not as a movie maker. I think the part where Mario eats a banana is one of the most sensuous things that's ever been filmed, which takes place throughout the whole film. <laughs> he eats many bananas. And um, maybe it's worth just mentioning um, um, why I call him him, um, even though um, he is a drag performer. Um, I, it's very difficult for me to call Mario Montez her, although I normally would, out of respect, refer to any drag performer as she. Um, but since Mario Montez made the quite radical and unusual decision, I think, for a drag um, performer to take on a male name as his female uh, performance identity, um, I, I find it fitting. And also since Mario um, Montez himself um, spoke about his, um, his female impersonation or female performance as, as part of his um, male acting, um, and so Miss Montez was always reserved for Maria Montez. Mario was always Mr. Montez, which makes him an even more fascinating transgender um, figure, I think. The off-screen improvised discussion between Tavel, Fainlight, and Linich on the soundtrack is a pun and innuendo-filled exchange that occasionally references the on-screen action. In fact, Tavell notes that Warhol asked the speakers if they would prefer to sit behind a screen when they spoke, so as not to see the action. Apparently, Fainlight thought it wise to see the action, and Tavell agreed. So, as you can see in this photo, the three of them sat in front of the other factory couch, the perhaps more famous one from Henry Geltzahler, apparently at some distance from the action. We can't really see how their relationship to the action, but we see them sitting in front of the, the microphone there. Um, photographer Eve Arnold, who was one of the 30 to 40 people Warhol invited to watch the filming, claims that the speakers moved around the set with their microphone, 
but I haven't yet been able to find any information corroborating this claim. And I, I assume that's incorrect um, because I think that they wouldn't have felt comfortable with this new sound equipment to do that. Um, and Eve Arnold, um, some of you may know, is um, quite a celebrated photographer who took these beautiful photos of Marilyn Monroe. Um, and she, that's the, she took the photo of, of Warhol that I'll show again in a second. Tavell characterized his performance on the soundtrack as that of a gossip monger. And although his opening lines, I was married to the star of this film, did you know that? Could have indicated the start of an exchange of personal revelations. The subsequent discussion merely retains the feel of gossip without any of its juicy content. Perhaps like my talk. Um, considering the on-screen action, it may seem only fitting that the three speakers constantly and variously return to the subject of bananas. At times in a kind of free association, actually bananas remind me of Carmen Miranda, Tavell says early in the film. At other times as a non sequitur, as when Feinlight yells out, bad banana, or as poetic nonsense, I wonder if the souls of banana flip through the night or as yet other, um, or at yet other, in fact, many other times with sexual associations. For instance, the banana looks like a French tickler. There are other references to stars too, such as Eartha Kitt, and to literary figures, such as Edith Sitwell, who had recently died. Who will take the place of Edith Sitwell? Asks Tavell a couple of times. And there is even one reference to Jean Harlow. Lynch asks, is that Jean Harlow? Feinlight responds, oh, forget it, she's dead. In such moments, when the discussion moves away from juvenile ramblings and nonsense wordplay and seems to reference directly something on screen, the soundtrack reveals itself as less an accompaniment to the image, as part of its dramatics, then as a kind of afterward to it, a spectatorial reaction to it, almost like the ones, and I don't know if you know this reference, but almost like the ones supplied by MTV's Beavis and Butthead, sitting in front of the television set, watching music videos and goofing off. That said, there are unexpected moments of a strangely moving dramatic intensity where sound and image seem to gel, particularly in the final moments of the film, as Fagan and Kaczynski douse each other with their drinks, the recording of Swan Lake rises on the soundtrack, and Tavell's voice takes on a violent, pleading tone as he declaims repeatedly, eat me, eat me, before the screen goes black. In addition to the recording of Swan Lake, which we also hear briefly at the start of the film. And I, I think, and we could talk about what we think the, the Swan Lake, what role that plays, but I, Tavell just says it was a popular record in the factory at the time, but I don't, we could talk about that. It, in, particularly at the end, it, it really seems like, wow, they really are making a Hollywood film, finally. Um, but we'll see. So in addition to the recording of Swan Lake, the soundtrack includes some chants ambient sounds that activate a lively off-screen space and reference thereby the context of the film's production. Most prominent in this respect is the metallic sound of hammering that randomly punctuates the discussion and makes it sometimes difficult to follow what's being said. Although in this case for a Warhol film, since they're sitting right next to the microphone, um, you, you hear them relatively well, even if we don't understand every um, silly, sometimes insipid thing they say. There are also street sounds, car horns, and other noises that provide a rich and lively surround to the film's actions and which somehow counter the impression of the temporal disjunction I just mentioned um, in terms of the spectatorial reaction um, um, uh, to, to uh, the on-screen, that, that temporal disjunction. Um, by recording, in these cases, quite specifically the time and space of the film's shooting. To my mind, however, 
the most significant off-screen sound we hear, besides the Tavel Feinlight lineage conversation. And interestingly, the one that has not been mentioned in any previous scholarship on the film is the voice of Andy Warhol himself, giving directions to the performers. I don't know if you will be able to hear him in the screening tonight, but I'm sure that you will hear someone's voice and notice the performers react to it. I was able to hear his voice most clearly when I watched the film on video with headphones at the Andy Warhol Museum. Um, we've already, since in this series, we've already speculated about the hushed whispers we hear on the soundtrack to some of the Warhol films. Um, I thought it's important to mention this, but um, moreover, I think it's important in the case of Harlot to specify clearly that it's Warhol's voice, off-screen voice we're hearing, and it's his directorial presence that we're sensing. This helps explain why Fagan, Malanga, and Kaczynski simply appear to be following instructions. They are. And it helps us better distinguish Montez's performance, not simply as an execution of tasks, but as a performance or interpretation of such simple actions as eat the banana slowly. Brazilian artist Elio Oichusica interviewed Montez in 1971 and asked him if Warhol gave him any instructions when preparing for Harlot, any suggestions for his costuming or explanations about how his performance should invoke such stars as Jean Harlow and Marilyn Monroe. Montez replied that all he could remember was that Warhol said things like, eat the banana slowly. He kept whispering, eat the banana slowly, very, very slowly. That we hear Warhol on occasion telling his actors what they should do on screen, and we actually do hear his off-screen voice giving directions in other films as well. We heard it in Mrs. Warhol. Um, it's also in the film Ari and Mario, both films from 1966. But that we hear him telling his actors what they should do confirms, if we still needed confirmation in this series, that he actually did direct these films. Being that this was his first sound film, I doubt that Warhol knew, or if he knew, cared about how well the microphone would pick up his own voice, since I believe it was at quite a distance, the microphone from the camera. However unintentional, Warhol's use of his own off-screen voice to solicit on-screen action in Harlot may actually be considered the model that Tavell followed and later Chuck Wine copied in such sound films as Screen Test No. 1 and 2, Beauty No. 2, and Poor Little Rich Girl. Even Tavell's The Life of Winnie de Castro follows the same pattern of, um, of a, a voice giving directions and soliciting reactions from the on-screen performers. In the case of Winnie de Castro, it places the directorial off-screen voice on screen behind the performers, instructing them on how they are to behave. And interestingly, that film also follows Harlot's lead in involving the use and exchange of a few select props. So the soundtrack, I'm suggesting, both opens, opens up the time of the film's production and suggests, by functioning as a post-film commentary on the on-screen action, the time of the film's reception as well. Tavell claims that Warhol was inspired by Jean Cocteau, who published the notes he took while filming Orphée to promote the film. Warhol asked Tavell to do something similar and ensured that the resulting text, Tavell's fascinating essay, The Banana Diary, the story of Andy Warhol's harlot, would be published in Film Culture Magazine in 1966. In The Banana Diary, Tavell claims Har oh, let me see if I have another image for you. Oh, too soon. Okay. Um, in The Banana Diary, Tavell claims Harlot's importance not merely as Warhol's first sound film, but as the film that inaugurated the star system in the underground. Posters for the film announced not just another film by Andy Warhol, but, as in Hollywood, Andy Warhol presents Mario Montez as Harlot. Although Warhol and other avant-garde filmmakers before him, Maya Darren, for instance, courted public speculation about their personas as much as their films, with Harlot, it would seem that Warhol, 
a keen student of the Hollywood star system, was ready to shift the focus of gossip more specifically to his superstars. Harlot received quick attention from both, both underground and mainstream press, which, as Tavell notes, spoke of it as a travesty on the currently raging Jean Harlow cult. Interest in the 1930s star had been renewed with the release of Irving Shulman's 1964 book, Harlow, an Intimate Biography, which received massive attention and, very strangely, inspired two competing biopics that were each released within a month of each other in 1965. Shulman's book was even, they're both very bad, um, but if they're both on YouTube, and if you watch one of them, I would recommend the Carol Baker one. Although in the um, one on the left with Carol Lindley, um, Ginger Rogers plays Jean Harlow's mother. But that one was shot on a strange um, black and white system, so it's a little difficult to, to watch. Shulman's book was even reviewed for film culture by underground star Taylor Mead, who confessed a gossipy epistemophilia in the opening lines. As a star, I'm interested in every detail of a star's life, however turgid, and Irving Shulman doesn't even fail to spare us the color of Jean Harlow's pubic hair. Good, we must know everything. Interestingly, Mead proceeds to criticize Shulman's scandalous use of such indiscreet details, not because of his tactlessness, but because he does not employ them to argue for the star's resistance to the uniformity of glamour production and the conventionality of acting in Hollywood. Mead claims that Shulman didn't understand that Harlow was not made already into a stock actress or a machine actress. She had not been sterilized of her own personality so that the lines coming from her came from a strange, individual, sexy root, Mead says. In addition to Mead's response, various other figures in the underground and the counterculture found themselves drawn to, drawn to Harlow around this time. And just a few other references um, to offer include the off-off-Broadway production of Tom Ian's play, The White Whore and the Bit Player, based on Harlow and Monroe, which premiered in August of 64 in New York. Harry Katukas's play, Tidy Passions or Kill Kaleidoscope Kill, an epic camp, which premiered in June of 1965 and featured an actor playing Harlow. And um, per perhaps um, most relevant in this respect is beat poet Michael McClure's play, The Beard, which premiered in San Francisco in 1965, featured Harlow as a character, and which was later filmed by Warhol in 1966. And um, I included here this cover page of a book, The Films of Jean Harlow, which um, was released um, in 1965 as a means of countering the scandal um, of, of Shulman's uh, biography with some hardcore facts about her films. Um, yes, As we can see, Warhol's harlot intervened directly in then current public and counter public gossip about the scandalous and supposedly incriminating details of Harlow's private life that were set in motion in part by Shulman's speculative and highly questionable journalism. It seems that by 1967, Hollywood star worship and the figure of Harlow, I couldn't resist this image, um, that by, uh, sorry, I lost myself because of the image. <laughs> Do you need some? Um, okay, it seems that by 1967, Hollywood star worship and the figure of Harlow herself was, was so associated with the underground that her name became the only prominent one donning a clothing ad for cricketeer clothes in the Evergreen Review. Note the cat in the woman's hands. Um, and I should thank Henning Engeke actually for drawing my attention to this article, which is, um, seems like it could be out of Mad Men. Um, if you can't read it here, the, sort of the appropriate clothes to wear to underground films. Um, and then on the right side, it says, what to say during intermission, Andy Warhol is getting cold. B-ins are better than happenings because you feel more a part of it. 
As Professor Marshall McLuhan says, media is the message. You don't know what all this means? Don't worry. Neither do the other people who are saying it. Just act like you do. Um, typical belittling uh, approach to the underground. For me, it's just simply interesting, of course, that, that the only name we see um, big is um, Jean Harlow. And practically the only face, I think that is that Rudy Valley. And then strangely enough, D.H. Lawrence in the background. Admin. Tavell claims that Warhol's intervention turned mass media, his intervention into this um, gossip, let's say, about Harlow, turned mass media into human meaningfulness. If, however, Warhol generated something humanly meaningful, something related to the defiant difference of Harlow's personality that so captivated Mead, he did so not by providing us with an explicit, accurate counter depiction of Harlow's lives and loves. Instead, Warhol employed details about Harlow's life to reveal something meaningful about the counter public differences in the world of his factory. As Tavell put it, Harlot circulates about the idea of Jean Harlow, the current suddenly palpitating cult whose insignia is bestsellers, TV interviews that have undusted 30s forget-me-nots for defense and scandal. As I will argue in the closing pages, Harlot circles as well around the idea of Mario Montez, at least for me. There is hardly a narrative element or situation in Warhol's film that could be viewed as explicitly dramatizing an aspect of Jean Harlow's films or her life. Indeed, Harlot's fascination derives more from the way in which it departs from its ostensible subject. This is not to say that one cannot identify oblique references to Harlow's star text. Shulman's biography, I think I have, oh yeah. Shulman's biography, for example, details Harlow's many marriages, the supposed impotence of her husband, Paul Byrne, her likely lesbian affairs, her drinking, and her sadomasochistic sexual tastes. The affectionate closeness between Montez and his intimate couchmate, Kaczynski, might be read as hinting at the possibility of Harlow's lesbian affairs while Malanga and Fagin can be seen as standing in for the star's many husbands. Most writing on the film referred to Kaczynski quite directly and unproblematically as Harlow's lesbian lover and Malanga as her mafia boyfriend. But I find this far-fetched. Additionally, Fagin's repeated failed attempts late in the film to flip a cigarette, a cigarette into his mouth might be meant to suggest Paul Byrne's alleged impotence. Such references to Harlow's star image are only confided, of course, to those truly in the know about the specificities of the star's life, as laid out by Shulman. Specificities, however, that were au courant at the time of the film's production and initial screenings. So in that sense, the film perhaps circulates in its time as a kind of gossip if you will, if you, if you want to take it as gossiping about, about the Hollywood stars. Tavell describes Harlow's star image as that of a street smart, foul mouthed tart whose dynamism and unselfconsciousness in the pursuit of pleasure contrasted starkly with the troubled realities of the Great Depression. She was, in his words, the white heroine of a dark age. In Tavell's prose, Harlow emerges as a uniquely American phenomenon, the comedian of frivolity, the therefore traditional America turning its back on the facts, he writes. The writer and flaming wit Quentin Crisp observed, quote, in spite of her platinum hair, Harlow's appeal was not glamorous, still less exotic or mysterious. She was sexy in the coarsest way. End quote. In her embodiment of sexual possibility, her screen association with social transgression, and her seeming foregrounding of frivolity over the facts, 
Harlow, we might even say, is practically the personification of gossip. These scandalous aspects of her star image would have been enough to attract the interests of an underground film scene attempting to counter Hollywood's prudish visions. Indeed, the attention Harlow's purported non-normative sexual behavior in the 20s and 30s received in the mid-1960s only served to strengthen the seductiveness of a star image whose erotic appeal was apparently unnoticed by the star herself. An essential part of the idea of Harlow was therefore the idea of a stimulating, seductive star image that arouses and relieves people from the bleak reality of their lives, but that nevertheless masks some bleak reality of its own. And we shouldn't forget, of course, that Harlow was a big star during the time of the Depression in the States. Um, for Tavel, however, this gulf between a lustrous star image and the bleak reality of a person's life reflects the ambivalent use of the individuals in Hollywood. In circling around the idea of Harlow, in expropriating and recirculating her image, the underground, according to Tavel, was in danger of recirculating as well the false promises and attendant shame incumbent upon the production of star images. The new American cinema, he writes in his inimitable and at times impenetrable prose. And here I quote at length from Tavel. So the new American cinema, he writes, has a way of holding faith with Hollywood for all its savageness a manner of burning off the superficial tinsel to touch the incredible essence of that body of belief in order to press it forward, in order to carry in triumph on shoulder height, in order to insist on its promise and perhaps foster its fulfillment. That the promise is the sham and its product sheer horror seems not to mitigate the naivete of the new American cinema. It is, yes, new, but it is still an American cinema." End quote. To briefly provide a gloss of what this might mean, I would say that that section of the new American cinema, which pulls inspiration from Hollywood, and we could think here of Jack Smith, Kenneth Anger, and Andy Warhol as the most famous examples. This section of the new American cinema does not believe in the coherence of the illusionist fantasy worlds depicted in Hollywood images, but in the power of an imaginative belief that ignites such lush, lush fantasy constructions. So the underground's own practices of belief, their investment in cheap sets with a transformative and imaginative power, enable it to expose and access Hollywood's own body of belief. In doing so, the underground expropriates the belief that drives Hollywood's image construction and uses it as motivation for its own less costly, less deceptively, and less superficially sparkling cultural productions. But what is the sham and sheer horror promised by Hollywood? I believe Tavel was thinking here about what is, for me at least, the most humanly meaningful aspect of Harlot, namely Mario Montez's conviction of his own seductive purposefulness in the midst of the film's, at times, seeming nonsense. Let me try to explain why I think this is so, and also how Tavel's observations might bring us back to Stoller's perspective on Warhol's art as an example of film and gossip mingling openly without shame. Tavel clarifies the importance of Mario Montez's star quality as follows. Make no mistake about it, Mario Montez believes he is the queen of the silver screen. The entirety of Harlot rests on his belief and its success is supported almost solely by his extraordinary belief. There is deliciousness in his gestures that passeth understanding. 
his coy rising to and sinking against the back of the couch when Swan Lake suddenly swells up at the end of the film is a piece of intangible truth that bridges our deepest ganglia. End quote. Tavell loved the purple prose, as we say. Not surprisingly, Tavell sees in Mario Montez those qualities he ascribed in other essays to Mario's feminine namesake, his, Mario's, and Jack Smith's beloved, Maria Montez, the actress from the Dominican Republic who rose to fame in the 1940s as star of fantasy and escapist films. These qualities, he saw, are belief in one's own beauty, the communication of intangible truths and images which exceed understanding, but affect us deeply. I've written about this in my essay, Jack Smith Glaubenschenken, so I won't rehearse this argument here. Thanks to Mario Montez's performance, Warhol's, Arlet, Warhol's Harlot succeeds in offering a fascinating image of female eroticism, one that aspires to the glamour of Hollywood silent stars, but one that admittedly falls short of convincingly embodying Jean Harlow. In Montez's belief in his own beauty and ability to produce a glamorous star image, Tavel sees both the strength of the underground and its potential for damage. He fears that what happened to thousands of other stars before him could happen to Montez as well. Namely, that he might believe in the longevity of his star image and in the continued interest and goodwill of filmmakers and audiences. Tavell writes, the spokesman of the movement, in the movement he means the new American cinema, tell us they will evade the destruction Hollywood trades in, the use and exploitation of the human element, and the rapid using up of it and casting it aside. Yet Mario Montez, is the movie queen all over again, the would-be imitation that wounds us to the quick because nothing has been imitated or genuinely travestied. It is Mario's belief which allows him to enlist the sympathy of the audience, as Jack Smith maintained. And it is this belief that, as Juan Suarez notes, made Mario ideal for roles where he is victimized, made fun of, and ostracized, or where he is simply out of sync with his environment. In Harlot, as you will see, Mario is neither victimized, as he is in screen test number two, in which Tavell harshly subjects him to various humiliating tasks under the guise of auditioning him for a film, nor is he made fun of, as he is in The Chelsea Girls, in which he is ridiculed by two men on a bed when he enters singing, they say that falling in love is wonderful. And in that film, we'll see it on June 5th, Mario actually just leaves the frame because the two men in the bed um, were so rude to him. In Harlot, um, he's not victimized, but he seems certainly out of sync with his environment, or perhaps better, it's out of sync with him. It is Mario's lack of sync, or to put a positive spin on it, his aspiration to another temporality that makes it impossible for this viewer, at least, to take Harlot as a film alone. It engages me in other ways. Mario's belief solicits not just my sympathy, but also my curiosity about him and the carefully created, ambiance-provoking conditions of his performance. I want to know more to supplement this compelling yet enigmatic screen image. I want to speculate about it. I want to speculate with it and share it with others who can embellish upon it according to their own desires and investments. I can do this about or with almost any star image, that's true, and I often do. But since Warhol's sound films never provide a coherent narrative world, even in the case of films that try or get close to it, like Hetty or Lonesome Cowboys. And since roles in Warhol's films are simply masks provided for the performers and designed to fall off 
and expose them. It would seem that his films are particularly ripe for a spectatorial response directed at the fascinating or irritating, depending on your tastes, individuals on and off screen. What better way to pass the often dead or stilled time of Warhol's cinema than to idle it away with gossip about those on screen? Thank you. Ja, vielen Dank auch von unserer Seite für den tollen Vortrag. Wir machen jetzt fünf Minuten Pause. Das Filmcafé hat auch noch offen. Sie können sich also nochmal Getränke holen und ja, dann geht's weiter.